In this lesson, we're going to discuss how one person can be held liable for crimes committed by another person. And we'll see that there's really two main ways that this can happen. We have accomplice liability, which we're going to spend the majority of our lesson talking about today. And we also have Pinkerton liability, which we touched on a little bit in our last lesson, but we're going to wrap up in a little bit more detail at the end of this lesson. And the big picture idea here is whether we're applying accomplice liability or Pinkerton liability, it's all about vicarious criminal liability. We're holding one person liable for crimes committed by another person. Accomplice liability, we're dealing with somebody who is providing assistance to another to help them commit a crime. A Pinkerton liability analysis would be more along the lines of, we've established that a conspiracy exists. Right? We have two or more people in a criminal conspiracy. Well, we remember from our last lesson, we talked about co-conspirators. If they commit crimes in furtherance of the conspiracy, each one is liable for those crimes committed in furtherance of the conspiracy. Right? That's Pinkerton liability. So it is important to recognize that these are two distinct concepts. They are different. They're not interchangeable. However, a lot of times they're both going to apply at the same time. It's really common that co-conspirators conspirators are also accomplices. So it is possible we could be applying both at the same time, but they are distinct analyses. So we'd want to break these up on a criminal law fact pattern and discuss them separately. And we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. But again, the big picture idea, whether we're dealing with accomplice liability and the you know, just providing assistance to another to help them commit a crime, or we're dealing with Pinkerton liability in the criminal conspiracy context, it's all about holding one person liable for crimes that have been committed substantively by another person. Okay, so we can start first with accomplice liability. And to really discuss accomplice liability, first we have to define who the parties are to a crime. At common law, we have four categories. We have the principal in the first degree, principal in the second degree, the accessory before the fact, and the accessory after the fact. So I'll go through these definitions fairly quickly. The principal in the first degree is going to be the person who is committing the actus reus of the crime. You can think about this as the trigger man, right? This is the person in the context of murder who is actually pulling the trigger to the gun that kills the victim, right? That would be your principal in the first degree. Your principal in the second degree is going to be any person who is providing assistance intentionally to the principal in the first degree during the commission of the crime, right? That is either actually present or constructively present, providing assistance at the scene of the crime, right? So this would be like the getaway driver or the lookout, right? The getaway driver, we would say, is constructively present. If someone is waiting outside for the murder to take place to help the principal in the first degree escape the scene, right? They might not be physically present right there in the moment as the murder is happening, but we'd say they're constructively present, right? They're still in close enough proximity to be providing assistance while this crime is taking place. We'd say the getaway driver is the principal in the second degree, right? The trigger man, the guy pulling the trigger to the gun, right, is the principal in the first degree. Next, we have the accessory before the fact. Accessory before the fact is very similar to the principal in the second degree. This is somebody who, before the crime is completed, is providing some type of assistance to the principal in the first degree. However, they are not actually present or constructively present at the time the crime is taking place. So this might be somebody who provides the murder weapon to the principal in the first degree, right? If I give a murder weapon, say I get a gun, and I give the gun to the principal in the first degree with the intent that that gun be used to commit murder, and then after I hand the gun to the principal in the first degree, I flee the country, I go to Mexico to hide, right? And then a few weeks later, the principal in the first degree carries out the murder with that gun I provided, I would be considered at common law an accessory before the fact because I provided assistance to carry out this crime, but I wasn't present at the scene when it was taking place. I wasn't constructively present or actually present at the time the crime took place, so I'd be an accessory before the fact at common law. An accessory after the fact, 
at common law is someone who's helping the principal in the first degree, right, get away with it once the crime has been committed. This is going to be helping the principal who committed the crime, you know, avoid police detection or avoid prosecution. It could be anything along the lines of hiding evidence, giving false statements to the police to try to throw them off, right, any form of tampering with the investigation or obstructing the investigation right after the crime has already been fully completed would be an accessory after the fact. This is usually somebody after a crime has been committed who is helping the principal right, avoid detection from the police. It could be hiding the principal somewhere, you know, providing assistance to the principal to get away, to get to a different country. It could be as simple as giving the police false information to try to throw them off the trail of the principal. Right, a lot of ways a person could be an accessory after the fact. The key distinction is they're providing assistance after the crime has been fully completed. Okay, so today in most jurisdictions, the way that this works is the principal in the second degree and an accessory before the fact we're just going to refer to as an accomplice, right? We kind of combine these two. We don't care whether someone was constructively present, actually present, or not at the time. Either way, we're going to just call them accomplice, right? This simplifies the analysis a lot. So we really don't need to worry about the distinction between a principal in the second degree and an accessory before the fact in our analysis. We're just going to call this person an accomplice. And we can just, for that purpose, call the principal in the first degree the principal, right? So we'll have a principal, and an accomplice, right? Just to simplify this, that's how most courts today are going to work through this analysis. We'll have a principal and we'll have an accomplice. Important to recognize that in most jurisdictions today, an accessory after the fact is its own substantive crime, right? If you help somebody, you provide aid to somebody after a crime has been fully completed, you're not going to be considered an accomplice, right? You're not going to be liable for the substantive crimes committed by the principal as an accomplice if you're an accessory after the fact it's going to be its own substantive offense right often a far less serious offense right where you're providing aid to someone who's already completed a crime that's its own separate offense right so if you see on a criminal law fact pattern that somebody the crime has been fully completed and now another person is providing assistance to that person right to the principal they're not really an accomplice they're an accessory after the fact and that's just going to be its own separate crime so what we're focusing on here in terms of accomplice liability and when we're thinking about who the accomplice is we're thinking about principal in the second degree and an accessory before the fact before the crime has been fully completed Okay, and again, an accomplice is liable for the crimes that the principal committed. Very straightforward rule, right? This is vicarious liability. This is how we hold one person liable for crimes that another has committed, right? We're holding the accomplice liable for the crimes that the principal has committed, right? So a very straightforward rule, an accomplice is liable for the crimes that the principal committed, notably, and all other crimes that were a natural and probable consequence or foreseeable result right so this extends right the accomplice liability doctrine extends beyond the target offense beyond the substantive crime to all other crimes that were a natural and probable consequence or foreseeable result for example right if we have an accomplice who loans a gun to a principal right accomplice says hey i have a gun you know, I want to help you commit a robbery, right? I know we need some money right now. So here's a gun. You go out and commit a robbery, right? And bring that money back and we can split it. And you can use my gun to commit this robbery. Well, of course, if the principal goes out and, you know, tries to commit a robbery, but something goes wrong during the robbery and the principal ends up killing the victim, right? And ends up being murder, right? Well, that accomplice who provided the gun would not only be liable for the robbery right they'd also be liable for the murder because the murder was a natural and probable consequence or foreseeable result right we talked about this when we were talking about the felony murder rule but generally it's very foreseeable 
that a robbery can turn into murder, right? When you're using deadly weapons to try to steal property from another person, right? A natural and probable consequence of this or a foreseeable result would end up being someone gets killed, right? Murder is a natural, you know, the killing of another human being is a natural and probable consequence of trying to steal property from someone using force or threat of force and deadly weapons, right? So in that instance, because it is a natural and probable consequence of foreseeable result, the accomplice would not only be liable for the robbery, but also the murder, right? So remember, it kind of extends to any other crimes, right? The accomplice is not only liable for the crimes that the principal committed, it's all other crimes that were natural and probable consequence or foreseeable result. Right, so the hard part of this analysis is identifying or defining who is an accomplice, right? If we know, okay, the rule is an accomplice is liable for the crimes that the principal commits, well, who is an accomplice? An accomplice is a person who assists the principal in committing a crime with the intent to do the acts that constitute the assistance and possessing whatever mental state is required for commission of the substantive crime. So we have three elements, right? Our first element is kind of like an actus reus element, and our second and third are kind of like the mens rea elements. And while we have an actus reus element and a couple mens rea elements, it's important to recognize that accomplice liability is not a substantive crime by itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. Accomplice liability is a form of derivative liability, right? It is not its own substantive crime. Sometimes I know students see elements and you see actus reus and mens rea and somehow accomplice liability morphs into being its own substantive offense, like a conspiracy, right? This is not its own substantive crime. Accomplice liability is just a doctrine of derivative liability, right? We're deriving liability for actions committed by the principal when these elements are satisfied. It's not that a substantive offense has occurred when these elements are satisfied. This just allows us to hold the accomplice liable for the crime that the principal committed. Just an important note to make here. But again, we can break this down element by element, starting with what is assistance, right? An accomplice is a person who assists the principal in committing a crime. Well, there's three basic forms of assistance. We have assistance by physical conduct, psychological influence, and or omission, right? So maybe the most common is assistance by physical conduct. This would be providing a gun to somebody, right? So we want to, I want to help somebody commit a robbery. So I go out and get a gun and provide them with a gun so that they can commit the robbery, right? That's assistance by physical conduct. I'm going out, I'm getting an item for them and getting it to them, right? Psychological influence, assistance by psychological influence would be things like encouragement or advising, right? So say we want to, or I want somebody to go commit a robbery. If I start encouraging them, hey man, you should really commit this robbery, we need the money, you know, this would be a good victim to go and steal from, right, whatever. If I'm encouraging, if I'm using psychological influence, right, if I'm assisting by psychological influence, right, I'm trying to influence another to commit a crime by, you know, either encouraging them or just providing advice. Hey, this would be a really great way to carry out this robbery. You know, if you do it at this time, at this location, you're not going to get caught. That type of stuff is going to be psychological influence, assistance by psychological influence. That is assisting the principal in committing a crime. And in some situations, we'll see an omission where there is a legal duty to act can actually constitute assistance. We're thinking about assisting the principal in committing a crime. Maybe the most classic example of this would be like a police officer accepting money to like not do anything while a crime takes place. So say a bank robber comes up to a police officer and says, hey, you know, I'm about to rob this bank. I know you're waiting outside here. Look, if you don't do anything while I rob the bank, I'll give you some of the proceeds of this bank robbery, right? Well, that police officer has a legal duty to act at that point, right? He's got a legal duty to try to take steps to prevent this bank robbery, right? The police officer just standing there and doing nothing while the bank robbery takes place, right? In that case where he does have a legal duty to act and he's failing to act, 
that could constitute assistance of the principal in committing a crime, right? You might see this also in like a parent-child relationship where a parent has a legal duty to act in certain situations with their child, right? If the parent has a legal duty to act, right, knows some sort of abuse is happening, you know, and turns a blind eye, it's those situations an omission could constitute assistance, could subject the parent to accomplice liability, right? Where they're failing to act, where there's a legal duty to act. But the most common types of assistance are physical conduct. This is like going out and getting the gun to be used or going out and getting an instrument to be used for commission of the crime or just encouraging somebody to commit a crime, giving them advice on good ways to accomplish the crime, right? This is all different forms of assisting the principal in committing a crime. Now, important to recognize when we think about how much assistance then is required, the general rule is while the assistance must be in fact effectual, any aid, no matter how trivial, is sufficient. So the assistance has to have some impact. It has to have some effect on the commission of the crime, right? If it's 100% ineffectual, right, then it's not assistance. So for example, say that, you know, I want to help somebody commit a bank robbery, so I go and, you know, find the vault, right? I find the schematics of the vault, and I type this all up in a big manifesto, and I email it in a PDF to the principal, right? Hey, this would be a great way to go commit this bank robbery. Here's the schematics. Here's how you do it, right? I'm providing advice and encouragement. Well, if the principal, right, the person who goes out and commits the bank robbery never sees that email, right? Never checks the inbox, never sees the email and goes and commits the bank robbery, that's not assistance because it had no effect on the commission of the crime. Right? You didn't assist the principal in committing the crime because the, crim the principal never saw the advice, right? the manifesto that you typed up that it was describing how to commit this bank robbery or stealing from this bank vault. Right? Because they didn't see that, it didn't have any effect. But on the other hand, important to recognize, it doesn't have to be very much of an impact. In fact, there doesn't really have to be a causal link between the assistance and the completion of the crime. Just any amount that has any impact, no matter how trivial, is sufficient. You know, this could be one sentence. It could just be like, yeah, man, I think it's a really great idea to commit this bank robbery. You know, that'd be a really cool idea to go and do that. Right, that could be enough. No matter how trivial, it's sufficient. Providing any assistance, as long as it's in fact effectual. Of course, if you provided this encouragement, but the principal never heard it, right? You said this and whatever reason, you know, maybe they had earbuds in, they're listening to music, they didn't hear you say it, then it wouldn't have any effect, right? And it wouldn't be assistance. But if they hear it, right, then at that point, no matter how trivial, any aid is sufficient. So takeaway here is it doesn't take much. Any assistance, no matter how trivial, is sufficient to satisfy this first element. Right, so the first element, our actus reus requirement for accomplice liability is a pretty low barrier, right? While it has to have some effect, any aid, any assistance, any type of physical conduct or psychological influence, any encouragement, no matter how trivial, is sufficient, right? So it's kind of easy to satisfy this first element, right? The mens rea requirements are a little bit more difficult, right? And so, number one, when we think about the mental state requirements here for accomplice liability, it's kind of two intent requirements. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap.
Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.